Hello guys, today we are diving into a topic that's often ignored, but trust me, it can destroy our components faster than speed of sound. We are talking about inrush current, what it is, how it behaves, why it happens, and most importantly, how to measure and control it. If you ever felt stuck between your socket ideas and an actual working CTB, then let me introduce our partner of today's video, which is RTM. RTM Designer is a complete PCB design tool where we capture schematic, design PCB layout, run simulations, and create manufacturing ready electronic circuit all in one software. It starts with schematic capture where we transform our paper circuit to a proper design, which is ready for simulation and layout. Then we can run SPICE simulations to test our design, to check the performance and catch any mistakes before they cost us time and money. And after that, we can directly optimize component placement on PCB and design layout with advanced routing tools. It even helps with wiring harness design, where we can plan, design, and document our wiring harness, which connect PCBs with each other. And now it gets even better with Altium 365, which connects our design to our teams, manufacturer, and even component suppliers to cloud. With this, our team can review, comment, and collaborate on the projects from anywhere in the world. Very important feature is its bomb portal. It keeps our component sourcing organized, where we can track component availability, compare suppliers, and check if we got the right parts before placing an order. So remember, Altium Designer is where we design our electronics, and Altium 365 is how we connect with the team to build the project into reality. And the best part is, you can try Altium Designer for free, and when you buy the license, you get 25% discount. Just have to click the link pasted below in the description. So, now on the video. Let's start from the very beginning. Imagine this. You have a circuit, say a power supply, and you switch it on. What do you think happens? In an ideal world, current would start from zero and gradually rise to the normal level as the system stabilizes. Like a person getting out of bed, stretching, and then starting the day. But in reality, the moment you turn the switch on, boom, a very high amount of current suddenly rushes into the circuit. This initial surge is called inrush current. It's also called as inrush surge current, switch on surge, or simply surge current. And where does this surge come from? Let's imagine. You got an empty bucket and you suddenly open a full speed tap into it. What happens? The water rushes in like a flood to fill up the empty tank. Just like that, in most electronic systems, capacitors are used for filtering and energy storage. When you power on a device, these capacitors are initially uncharged, like empty buckets. As soon as voltage is applied, they try to charge instantly, which causes a huge amount of current to flow into them because of their very low internal resistance, which is usually in milli ohms, and that's the inrush current. Same goes for inductive loads like motors or transformers. Turn on, they also draw a much higher current for a short period of time. Even purely resistive loads, like heating elements, can exhibit inrush current if the resistance increases with temperature, like tungsten filament lamps. So, inrush current is often due to charging capacitors, magnetizing cores, or temperature-based resistance changes. Today, we'll focus on the resistive inrush current. It's big, it's fast, and it can be dangerous. The math behind it is very simple. The inrush current equals capacitance times rate of the voltage change. 
the faster the voltage rises or the bigger the capacitor is, the higher will be a current spike. And this isn't just theoretical. It happens every time when you power up a system. Let's talk about waveforms. That's where we get into the juicy engineering part. When you look at the current versus stack waveform during the power up of a device, you'll see something like this. Right at the beginning, when power is applied, current spikes sharply to a peak value. This peak might be 5 times or 20 times higher than the normal operating current. After a few milliseconds, it decays exponentially and stabilizes to the steady state current. For example, if your normal current is 1 ampere, then interest can be easily up to 10 amperes or more for very brief moment. Typically, this interest current stays from a few microseconds to a few hundred milliseconds. Every electronic component has a safe operating condition. If you go beyond that, the part will fail. And this transient is what stresses the component. Now, you might say, hey, it's just a short spike. Why we have to worry? Well, here's the thing. Many components are not rated for such high peak currents. So, it can damage the electron components. To survive this inrush current, we would have to oversize everything. Wires, fuses, MOSFETs and diodes in the circuit to withstand this. Inrush current can cause a voltage drop or sag across the power supply, leading to brownout resets in microcontrollers or sensitive ICs. Well, even if it doesn't destroy the components immediately, because of the repeated stress, it affects the component life cycle. And if you have multiple devices switching on simultaneously, the problem multiplies. We can check such inrush current and voltage drop on an oscilloscope. So, how to limit inrush current? There are basically two methods using which we can reduce this inrush current. One is passive prediction and another is active prediction circuit. In passive inrush current limit circuits, the most common example is negative temperature coefficient thermistor. Its working is very simple. At room temperature, the thermistor has high resistance, so it limits the inrush current. As it heats up due to current flow, its resistance drops, allowing full current to pass during normal operation. In some systems, a relay or a MOSFET bypasses the thermistor once the startup phase is over, which improves efficiency. Well, there are a few limitations to this solution. It doesn't work well for rapid on-off cycles because the thermistor hasn't cooled down for every new cycle and it is not useful for very high power application systems. That's where we use active inrush current limiter circuits. These are usually made up of transistors, timing circuits or microcontrollers to intelligently limit inrush current. These are more expensive but this is the best option to limit it. We'll talk about such circuits in detail in the next video. Well, that's it for today's deep dive into inrush current. If you learned something new from this, don't forget to check the description for more references. If you found this video useful, hit that subscribe button as well and stay tuned for more exciting content.